Hello and welcome to my video. My name is Cami and I am a chronically online college student and this is for my Philosophy 8 class. This course explores the world's major religions and their origins, history, and significant ideas. This is my alternative assignment for Module 4 where we covered Buddhism. Today I will discuss basic Buddhist teachings and share my connections and reflections. Also, as always, all of my sources will be listed in the description below if you want to do more research. Okay, let's get into it. This week we learned about Buddhism, a philosophy based on the life of the historical Buddha. Buddhist philosophy is primarily about inner study and development through practices such as meditation. We learned about this through an essay by Dr. Glorian and a YouTube video from PBS where Bill Moyers sits down and discusses Buddhist philosophy with Pema Chodron, a Buddhist nun and recognized master. Similarly to last week, I made many reflections on the lesson, and as with every week, I wish I had more time to dive deeper into the topic. I enjoyed the formatting of last week's video, where I let the terminology flow throughout rather than restricting them to the top of the video, so I'm going to try and do that again this week. Also, a little disclaimer, I did have some trouble writing the script this week due to wanting my video to be educational but still reflective. I want to make sure that my video isn't purely summarizing or regurgitating the essay, so I'm going to try and keep my summaries to a minimum. I know that the only people watching this video or this series regularly are my mom, my boyfriend, and my professor, but since Dr. Glorian is a viewer, I want to follow his instructions and minimize the summarizing. So if you don't understand something within the video, mom or Steven, just send me a text. Okay. Let's actually discuss the basic teachings of Buddhism. What are they, and what do they teach? Today's main topics I'll touch on are the meanings of no-self and nirvana, and the four passing sights, the four noble truths, and the eightfold path. I was initially going to try and simplify the ideas of the noble truths, passing sights, and eightfold path to four plus four equals eight, but then upon a second glance, I realized that's not even correct. So instead, I chose to use 448 to help me refer back through my notes. Because they're all separate ideas, but they can intertwine and combine to create the main principles of Buddhist teachings. I hear you say, okay, great, Cami, you simplified the terms for yourself, but what does that mean for us? Well, be patient, I have that covered. But in order to explain, I have to do a little bit of background. I learned that the Buddha was born in India around 563 years before the Common Era and lived for 80 years. His name was Siddhartha Gautama. And story goes that Buddha's dad, quote, was told in a prophecy that his son would either be a great religious teacher or a great world ruler, end quote. Well, dad over here didn't want his son to be a religious leader, so he decided to do everything that he could to keep young Siddhartha away from anything that would cause him any distress or discomfort or make him question anything about the world. So he's kept in this beautiful pleasure palace with all of the people and things that he could desire. Despite this though, Siddhartha would sneak out of his palace with a servant when he was able, and allegedly he escaped four times. And each time he saw something that caused him to reevaluate his perspective on the world he lived in. And this is where we come to the four passing sights. During these four times Siddhartha was outside the palace, he saw death, sickness, and aging before his eyes. Despite it being completely unfamiliar to him, he decided to keep escaping. And from these sights, the Buddha learned that he could get sick, he will age, and that one day everyone he knows and loves, including himself, will die. His final sight was when he met a wandering yogi and was told about liberation the wheel of death and rebirth for the first time. Many would assume that after leading a pampered and pleasureful lifestyle and then being shocked as he had, Siddhartha would immediately reject these new facts and return to living his unexamined and comfortable life. But no, the Buddha still decided to escape his father and enter the world he'd been specifically shielded from. He realized that, quote, the crisis of sickness, old age, and death is something all reflective people have to face, end quote. And so he decided to devote his life from then on to, quote, the pursuit of this liberation, end quote. Okay, great. So what did the Buddha do after deciding to leave home and abandon his life of material wealth? Well, he traveled to, met, and trained with many holy teachers around his country. 
But during this time, he, he practiced Hinduism and was very serious about his practice of asceticism, which I learned is severe self-discipline and avoidance of forms of indulgence. He fasted so much that he almost died from starvation at one point. But over these several years, he came to realize that, quote, Hindu philosophy and practices were not the final door he needed to walk through, much to the disgust of some of the companions he had practiced with, end quote. He decided to push further. He would sit underneath a fig tree, also known as the Bodhi tree due to the Buddha reaching Bodhi, enlightenment, underneath this tree, and do nothing. Do nothing but meditate until he'd reached this liberation. Some tellings of this story would have you believe that he ate only a single hemp seed a day during this time, but after further research I found that no evidence supports this. But I thought it was important to mention because it was a story that I'd been told, and it was curious. During this period of 49 days of unmoving meditation, the Buddha awakened. According to Michael Malloy, quote, he saw the mutual interdependence of all things and how egocentric ignorance leads sentient beings inevitably through desire to suffering, death, and unhappy rebirth. The four noble truths appeared in his mind. End quote. What are these truths? They are 1. Life has inevitable suffering. 2. There is a cause to our suffering, desire. 3. There is an end to suffering. And 4. The end to desire and suffering is contained within the Eightfold Path. So now I hope you can understand why 4 plus 4 equals 8 was originally going to be my simplification. But as you can see, like I did, it's less like a math problem and more like first came the four passing sights, next came the four noble truths, and within those four noble truths is the Eightfold Path. But what is the Eightfold Path? Dr. Glorian explains, quote, Buddhist philosophy tries to be practical. If you want what the Buddha is offering, then there are steps you have to take, end quote. These steps make up the Eightfold Path. These steps are, one, right view. To see things clearly, not through illusions or ignorance. Two, right intention. Staying committed to the process and practicing often. Three, right speech. Being mindful of your words and making sure not to use your words to hurt others by gossiping or degrading. 4. Right action. Making sure our actions match our words and that we are positive blessings in the lives of others. 5. Right livelihood. What you do for a living can impact your spiritual practice, and there are some strictly forbidden jobs, being a drug or weapons dealer, for example. 6. Right effort. Being committed to our practice and using our energy appropriately for the right reasons. 7. Right mindfulness. Learning to use our minds rather than letting our minds use us. And 8. Right concentration. Developing meditative states of concentration to help the mind focus its energy. These eight steps are taken simultaneously, unlike a 12-step program where you have to complete one step before you can complete the next. Using these practices, we can focus the mind on the Four Noble Truths and the idea of no self to reach nirvana. Nirvana, also sometimes called Bodhi, is the Buddhist name for enlightenment, a state of awakened consciousness. However, it's important to remember, quote, this state cannot be described to someone because it must be experienced to be understood, end quote. Nirvana is an otherness that is found utterly desirable according to Buddhist literature. And no self is the idea that we are nothing more than streams of consciousness. For example, the Buddha said that when you look for yourself in your mind, you'll find a stream of thoughts and emotions, but no actual self. Or as Dr. Glorian asks, if you take away the parts of a human being that we normally think of as ourselves, such as our body, emotions, or thoughts, is there an underlying self? End quote. Dr. Glorian further discusses how we tend to identify ourselves with our emotions by saying things like, I am mad, I am hungry, I am frustrated, I am happy. But these things are not who we are. These are passing, fleeting thoughts and feelings. But I tend to do this and I've noticed how it will become a self-fulfilling prophecy. When I say, I am mad, I stay mad. 
I've decided after reading about this to make a conscious effort to say, I am feeling mad or I am experiencing feelings of anger right now, rather than to say, I am mad. Or as Dr. Gloria notes, quote, one way of meditation consists of saying things to yourself, such as I have emotions, but I am not my emotions, end quote. Or as my mom would say, quote, recognizing our emotions without being caught by them, like clouds passing in the sky, our emotions are not who we are, end quote. Thanks, mom. This meditation and thought practice falls in the right mindfulness right view and right intention steps of the Eightfold Path. Now I want to talk about a few of my reflections from the video, so that's what I'm going to do. Of it, you see. Do, do but you, yes, I have great uh, veneration for the Buddha. Do you pray to him? Like Christians pray to Jesus? Uh, no, no I don't pray to him. Um, or even think of him necessarily as a role model. He was a person like myself that uh, woke up the way I could and the way all sentient beings could, could. I found this section interesting because I related her answer to a similar perspective regarding Jesus that I have. I've held the belief that Jesus is the same as Jonah, Moses, David, both of them, or King Solomon. They're prophets, or what I would now describe as mystics, who were either blessed with a special messenger relationship with God or what my new take on a long-held perspective is, they practiced their faith until they reached their interpretation of enlightenment and then decided to share these ideas and messages with the public. Granted, the possibility remains that all of these stories and people are just complex allegories to teach lessons about the problems of evil. But let's go off the assumption that all these people and events were real and that everything written within the Old and New Testament is at least 85% factually accurate. Jesus himself references that he's not God and that the power he possesses can be found in all of us. Even if he said, there is no other way to God than through me, what if he meant his teachings, not him as a person or a belief in his powers? I relate this to the Buddha's dying words, quote, work out your salvation with diligence, end quote. I may be completely off, but I felt like this was an interesting connection that I had. What the Buddha taught was what reasserts itself is he, the classic texts call it adventitious. It means removable. It's temporary. Neurosis is temporary. Sanity is permanent. <laughs> I like that. I like that too, Bill. It's affirming to learn that there are viewpoints out there like Buddhism and Hinduism that believe that stress, anxiety, suffering, and frustration are temporary or illusions. And that by being one with yourself, by being one with the universe, we can be free to live in a truly awake state and be able to share that with the world around us. And I think that's wonderful. I might be wrong. Maybe basic badness is the fundamental state, but basic goodness makes for a much happier world and for feeling more at home in the world and more friendship. So I came out feeling, you know, I'm open enough to maybe when I die, you know, some big plaque comes up and says, you were wrong your, all your life. <laughs> you believed in your whole life was wrong. I, I think I'm preparing for that moment, you know, for it not to be anything that I thought it was, and it would be okay. And do you see what I'm saying? I've noticed a recurrence of this viewpoint with many teachers of different faiths. I've also noticed it amongst elderly lay people, not all, but some. There's a certain acceptance, I think, after living and experiencing so much, regardless of faith or philosophy, that they're okay with whatever comes next and they're ready for the next show regardless of what that will be. This is a much more post-rational approach than mine which is exemplary of my youth and the fear of my own mortality. I am 25 though so I think I have some time to come to grips with this without the thought of it sending me spiraling. After over 30 years on this path of enlightenment that you began on when you took that vow of uh, to be a nun do you feel you're close to a state of perfection? No. <laughs> no. Uh, I'm happy. I'm very happy. I feel satisfied with my life. If I died tomorrow, I'd feel I hadn't wasted my life. Uh, but my appetite is insatiable, and I feel I have a long way to go, you know, in terms of 
perfection. I related to this not because I've practiced a mystical path for 30 years because, well, I mean, I haven't even been alive for 30 years and heck, I haven't even practiced any sport for over five consecutive years. But I know that I have a long way to go until I reach a state where I feel satiated and good enough in my search for answers and my journey of self-development. I also feel what she just said perfectly feeds back into what she shared about being open enough to be wrong. So, you know, one of the things with the Bodhisattva warrior, they say that uh, no matter how far you get in terms of being unhooked yourself or being happy yourself, or always look back at who you used to be. Never forget to look back at the neurosis that you carried for so many years. Otherwise, you'll lose your contact with the suffering of other people. Mm -hmm. So for the bodhisattva warrior, the, this, our kinship with each other is the crucial thing, you know. So it isn't that really you want to avoid the pain of the world because that educates you about what other people are up against. I found this fascinating because I never knew this was a Buddhist teaching or principle, but thanks to my mom, I do this often. When I have the worst days where nothing is going right and it feels like everything is working against me, I try to think of things I'm grateful for and the people that I love. When I am consciously and verbally grateful, I often reflect on where I am now versus where I was three to five years ago. I do this because of a metaphor that my mother has used and lived all of my life, hiking up a mountain trail. The climb is challenging and there will be many times that you want to turn around and go back, but when you get to the top, you reflect on the big picture view and see the speck that is your car in the parking lot way down below. You feel so good and rewarded and proud of yourself for not giving up. By applying this metaphor, I can recognize my situation now may be unfamiliar and challenging, but it's wonderful and I am so blessed to be where I am right now. And now learning that this practice has Buddhist significance, I feel even more drawn to practicing this. This week, I want to close by sharing a reflection I wrote down at some point while reading, but I did not have the sense to mark where I was in my reading, so I figured I would just use it for my final thoughts. Cosmic religions are experimental. We keep hearing that. That means you have to experience them and choose to take a mystical path, essentially playing this long game, or like Dr. Glorian said, quote, to really get it takes a long time, end quote. But through this long path, hopefully you'll reach the goal of truly understanding and appreciating the teachings that you follow. Cosmic religions are nothing like a once a week Bible study, church gathering, or one and done training to convert to a religion. Buddhism, Hinduism, and many other Eastern philosophies and cosmic religions are practiced every minute of every day. Even after his enlightenment, the Buddha practiced and taught for 40 years until his death which means he was 40 when he finally achieved enlightenment. So honestly, we've got nothing to worry about. These philosophies deeply fascinate me, and the more I learn, the more interested I become. I love that there is a path to break away from physical attachments, earthly desires, and fears. I'm excited by the thought that I can share this newly found knowledge with others and we can grow our collective understanding. I am so eager now to seek out people with different spiritual beliefs than mine and learn from them and hear their interpretations. The more I learn from this course, the more grateful I am to have picked it and I can now consciously observe my perspectives and worldviews being challenged and in turn they're changing and they're opening and broadening in ways that they never have before and that's amazing. Thank you so much for watching my video. This was so much fun to make and to research and I took so much away from the lessons this week, but I don't want the video to be too long, so I hope I reflected and recapped, but hopefully not too much on the recap, and explained in a way that you can understand and hopefully learn a little bit from. As I mentioned at the beginning, all of my sources will be listed in the description below, and you can follow any of those to start your research. I highly recommend you check out the video listed below, 
And as always, a huge thank you to Dr. Glorian for allowing me to create assignments that help me better learn, understand, and engage with the course's materials. And with that, the video's over, and I will see you next week where we discuss Taoism. Bye!